G'day guys, today I want to talk about someone who's actually quite significant and inspirational in my journey into the medieval world. Today I want to talk about a genuine hero of the Anglo-Saxon uprising post-Norman conquest. Today we're going to talk about Herald the Wake. That's coming up. do is just mention a few things right here. Number one, you need to uh, remember that so much of history has been lost in time, whether it was the disillusionment of the monasteries, whether it was a variety of different Viking raids, that kind of thing, whether it was internal unrest, whatever it may have been, history has been lost. There's also a lot of history which gets lost in translation and that is to say that words were only standardized in the Victorian era. That means things like spelling and definitions of words really only solidified their purpose and meaning during the Victorian era. And that's really important to remember. So uh, one person's way of writing something may have been entirely different to somebody else's. And uh, from a historical point of view, that can make uh, following the evidence quite difficult. So let's take a look at what some of that evidence may be. There is a variety of different pieces of evidence we're going to use here. The first being uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Uh, specifically, this is the Peterborough Chronicle. We're also going to look at the Doomsday Book, the Book of Eli, and the Gesta Hawadi. Alrighty-o. Now, it's really important to understand that the accuracy, the historical accuracy of these books is always questioned and that is to say that they were written for a purpose or an agenda uh, because they were paid and sponsored by particular individuals. Uh, for instance, the Carmen uh, we know is, is essentially written for um, William the Conqueror so it has a very strong bias. Same, same as um, the way the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is written. It has a very strong bias um, against the, the Scandinavians. You'll find that some of these texts are actually cr uh, contradictory to themselves. And you have to compare that against um, some of the oral traditions and that kind of thing. So, in terms of genuine forensic historical accuracy, it's a little bit difficult to really gain. Okay, so, so the in the Gesta Hawadi, um, which is a, a Middle Latin text written sometime in the early part of the 12th century, and much of that document has been lost. Uh, so we're really working on translations from some time ago. And when you, when you go from translation to translation to translation, then uh, again, its historical value tends to fall off. When we take a look at um, Harold's family, so this gets a little bit interesting. We know his father was Leofric of Bourne, who is the nephew of Ralph the Staller, and his mother was Egith, uh, a descendant of Oslac of York. Harold was described as being naturally handsome, a generous man, and bold. However, uh, he also seemed to have an inclination to find himself in trouble and eventually he was sent away in his late teens by his father. Eventually his father had to actually petition the King of England at that time, who was Edward the Confessor, to actually have his son banished. So his son, as in Herald the Wake, was obviously doing stuff which was going to tarnish the family name. and. At that time, the family name meant a whole lot more than it generally does today. 
Harold uh, seemed to be intent on visiting his father's um, relatives and homeland. We know that during his exile, he seems to have travelled through uh, Cornwall Island, Flanders, which is continental Europe in modern day France. Uh, it's possible that um, he may have even gone back into Scandinavia. We're not really sure. Because of the confliction of evidence and, and the difficulty to find uh, very reliable evidence, it, it may as well end up regarding some of what has been written about him historically uh, essentially as fiction. Radio. So in the Gesta Huwadi, now I do apologise for my pronunciation there, I don't speak in Old English and um, uh, there we go. So let's, let's see how we go. Sometime after the, uh, the death of Count Baldwin V of Flanders, which would be early September 1067, Harold finds that the Norman conquest had taken place and that um, his own hometown has been turned into disarray by the Normans. Obviously, we're talking about some very kind of um, biased sort of accounts here. So these, these are accounts that are written with the um, Harold's family in mind. Harold finds that his brother has been killed and his head placed on a spike at the gate to the, to the family home. Harold becomes infuriated and seeks to take revenge on the Normans who had killed his brother. Harold now pursues these, yeah, these Norman knights. He wants to find them and, and confront them. Clearly not the best idea. However, he finds them drunken in a pub, basically feasting. He finds these, uh, these Normans are, uh, are being very disrespect, disrespectful to the, the name of, of the Harold family. And Harold in a rage, then slaughters these Norman knights. Allegedly, there was at least 15 of these Norman knights. Now, if we put this into context, right, these Norman knights were the modern, like, the historical equivalent of, of the SAS in Britain, commandos, you know, um, Navy SEALs or, or Special Forces dudes, that kind of thing. These are, are highly professional warriors, many of them, may well have taken part in the early Norman conquest of England. So these would have been true fighters. They would have really understood battle. So to take on any single one of these people would have been a fairly big deal. To take on uh, you know, a group of 15 of them or more potentially, um, you are essentially, you know, you've, you've got to have your skills and hope that um, the alcohol has caused a significant disadvantage to your opponents. It pays off for Herald and he kills all of them. He puts their heads on stakes and returns home. In the Gesta, that is one of the primary sources, we know that um, William of Warne's brother-in-law, Frederick, swore to kill Herald, but Herald outwits him and slaughters him. The Normans now absolutely furious. This is broken Norman law, it's broken how they perceive a variety of other laws and a small rebellion is seeded. People can start to see, Anglo-Saxons are seeing um, only a year after the conquest that the Norman Knights are not necessarily uh, as, as strong as they had been perceived to be. We know that um, Herwald built his popularity around an area known as the Fens. It's difficult to say for sure, we don't really know, but the Fens may well have been uh, an area of, I guess, modern day England, which would have included places like uh, modern day Cambridgeshire, Lincolnshire, Norfolk, and, and that sort of area. So we don't really know um, precisely where. However, across a period of about 18 months, Harold built, built a sizable kind of popularity amongst the, the, the local population. And this culminates uh, at the Battle of Eli. Now, we'll get to that in a few seconds. We know that this big insurrection really gained, uh, I guess, a strength in the years sort of 1069 and 1070. The Danish king Sven 
Estrickson. Now, I do apologise for my pronunciation there. I am sorry. Um, I'm pretty sure I got that wrong. He sends a small army to try and establish a camp on the island of Eli. And Harold appears to have joined him. Harold storms and sacks Peterborough Abbey in the company of local men and Sven's Danes. Now there's some conflict of evidence around exactly what's happened here and I guess why and sort of how much of a, a damage this has caused um, and I guess the justification for the raid. Um, clearly the Danes are simply suggesting that they're putting the treasure in safekeeping in Daneland or Denmark um, whereas other people, particularly the English, may have perceived Danish taking English treasure from a church as, hmm, I'm thinking this may have happened a few times before. Now, Earl Morcar, who was the Earl of Northumbria, joins Harewald, we are fairly sure. Uh, now, he's been ousted as being Earl of Northumbria because, um, of the, the Norman conquest. The Normans want their own people into strategic places of leadership. William, uh, frustrated by the lack of progress of his own people, now decides to lead the army himself. So William the Conqueror. In 1071, Harold and Morcar were forced to retreat to a stronghold and made a desperate last stand in the Battle of Eli against the conqueror's rule. Now, again, there's, there's a fair few sort of different... During this, uh, the raid on Eli, it is said, but again, can't be con confirmed, that William the Conqueror was, felt so desperate that he had to resort to pretty much anything. What could he do? Some people suggest that uh, William the Conqueror employed the use of a, a local witch we're not sure if that's true or not or to what extent the witch's role was uh, it's said that um, she climbed up on top of a tower and was casting curses and all these sorts of things at her world and his people but eventually the tower catches fire the witch falls down and is burnt in the process there's a whole lot of different points of view on this. Now in these days, these fens were wetlands, right yo? The wetlands were drained long ago in, in today's terminology and all the wildlife has long since gone. In this time, however, in the wetlands there would have been bridges between different small islands, right? So some of these wetlands may have been sort of several meters deep, others less so. And to get between the islands, you had to cross on causeways. Now, it's said that one of these causeways was over a mile long. William the Conqueror, desperate to catch Herbal the Wake, orders his men to cross the bridge. He's frustrated at their lack of progress, orders them across faster, faster, faster. These men, remember Norman knights, heavily weighed down by gambeson, chainmail, several different weapons, shields and all of the other gear that would have been going with them. Some of them obviously on horseback too. All crossing this mile long bridge. That is a mile in today's terminology, roughly speaking, 1600 metres. So clearly there could have been over a thousand people on this bridge at any one point and the bridge collapses under their weight. Many, many, many of these Norman knights, we don't know how many, were, uh, were killed via drowning. William the Conqueror would have been furious. A substantial portion of his English army is now either dead or at least incapacitated because of the cold and the wet and cannot continue. More to the point, the access to that island is now restricted. There's a lot of stories at this point around uh, Harold's capacity to use his guile. So a guile really is, uh, I guess, the ability to, to use your wits to outwit your enemy. Um, the stories of Harold dressing up as a potter to, um, to evade capture. There's stories of him 
uh, sneaking into the camp of William the Conqueror as a jester and so on. Some of these stories are confused with Alfred the Great stories and other stories from other, other people who resisted the Norman invasion. So it's difficult to actually pick away at what is fact and what is fiction and whose story is whose. We're not entirely sure. Harold obviously, however, was a very smart man and a very, very, um, had a lot of battle sense, I guess is the way to describe it. William the Conqueror has now, dis um, for, for this point, has simply laid siege to the stronghold while he tries to figure out where to get more men from. Around about this time, we have something else occurring, which is called the Earl's Revolt. Now, we'll talk about this in a separate video um, because... The Earl's Revolt is, is actually a very interesting point and uh, I think it's very deserving of its own video. We know that after Eli, Harold uh, escapes to Northamptonshire or modern day Northamptonshire, uh, but William is pers uh, pursuing him relentlessly. This is kind of like a, you know, public enemy number one and everyone's out to get him to capture the reward. And it smells a lot like the stories of, at least some of the stories of Robin Hood. And I definitely think that Herald Awake is the inspiration for some of these original stories of Robin Hood. It's even said that Herald Awake put some of the shoes backwards on his horses to confuse people tracking him. That's actually pretty incredibly smart, I've got to say. Various skirmishes are reported and recorded in history. It's difficult to know how much of it's true and not, um, but those, at least some of these, are very closely linked to Herwald, or at least Herwald's people. So it's, I, I think some of that's credible. We don't know the exact end for Herwald the Wake. Numerous sources report that several years after this, so we're now talking 1073, 1074, that Herwald has been living in the Fens essentially as an outlaw, or at least supported by some of the people locally. That would have been very rough living, it would have been very, very difficult to do. But again, I think we're seeing some of the links to some of the original Robin Hood stories. I think that's very, very interesting. We, we hear through our numerous sources that Herwald is trying to find a way to reconcile with William the Conqueror. However, a whole bunch of different stories now seem to arise. Um, there's stories that Herwald was sent into exile. There's stories that Herwald was pardoned. There's stories that, um, in fact, he remarried, so he gave up on his original wife and, and married again, uh, a wife suggested by William. I find that story a little bit hard, but I wasn't there at the time. Um, we also hear that there's other stories which suggest that uh, Herwald was eventually slaughtered by a group of Norman knights and his body cast into the forest. Once again, it's, it's really difficult to pick away the truth from the fiction and which story belongs to which person because this is all convoluted a lot over time and there's really no forensic evidence or anything like that to, um, to back any of these different stories up. So unfortunately, we just don't know what happened to Herald the Wake. We just don't know where he went and what the end of his tale was. Um, historians do not dispute the existence of Herald the Wake, uh, although many parts of his story remain disputed because the primary sources do conflict. Uh, it's unfortunate. Um, but again, as I said before, Many of these primary sources were written by people with very strong motivations, whether it was an allegiance or loyalty towards the Normans, whether it was an allegiance or, or loyalty towards uh, what was Anglo-Saxon England. Perhaps it was loyalty towards the church, but as I said, Peterborough Abbey got sacked and the church would have seen Herwald as a, as a perhaps a traitor, certainly an outlaw. And we don't really know what the extent of the damage to the church was. We know uh, for, for sure that Herwald led a resistance. And um, we know that that resistance was really very successful. Alrighty guys, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.